All right. They put me up here to get us back on time for lunch. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been covered already this morning, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. My name is Dan Peoples. I am the Farm Bill Biologist for Orangeburg, Calhoun, and Clarendon Counties. And again, you know, I cover beyond those areas as well. Uh, if you have any questions for me, if you got property in the area, just flag me down. I'll be happy to talk with you. We'll set up something. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the use of fire with uh, Bob White management. Now let's get this thing going. Again, you know, back to habitat needs, you know, they need their nesting cover. We've covered this extensively already with the clump grasses over uh, sod grasses and things like that. Um, again, this is the kind of habitat you'd expect for nesting, nesting cover. You know, got a lot of clump grasses in here with scattered uh, forbs and shrubs and things like that. Uh, again, nesting cover. Uh, and again, it's for little bob white chicks. Uh, you really need to have that nesting cover in close proximity to brood rearing areas so they don't have to travel so far to feed. Uh, that's very important. That's why it's important to have all this stuff kind of intermixed into, a, into an area. Uh, brood cover, same thing. You know, we've covered it extensively. It, you know, anything, you gotta think of a quail chick as the size of your thumb. You need to make sure there's food available in the growth structure of that area for them to feed, but also have enough overhead cover to, um, to allow for protection from overhead. Uh, again, uh, Bob White Habitat needs, you see a nice little intermixing of clump grasses, some forbs in there, and then you got some woody cover in the back. Uh, loafing cover, cover uh, kind of covey headquarters, very important different times of year for thermal regulation and also just to kind of um, chill out throughout the day. <clears throat> Again, you know, we've seen these pictures before. You know, just little blocks, usually about 400 square feet is ideal to have these, and you know, say within 100 yards of one another. Basically, you, you want to be able to be in one spot and not be more than 100, 150 yards from some kind of escape cover, and that's really good escape cover right there. Uh, you know, again, just different kind of shrubby materials. Um, and also, it's just going through the different species and how they utilize different habitat types. And as you can see, early sessional habitat is pretty key for bob whites, and so is uh, brushy cover. Same with the rabbit and, uh, and a couple others. Um, the shrub scrub birds, you know, they share about similar. And of course, you got you know, the larger animals like your rabbits, they, they don't fare as badly as the bob white because they can move. They're more apt to move if they lose their cover and they can move further distances. Um, and again, grassland areas have been in decline for a long time. I mean, you see from 1968 on, uh, we have had a good increase of wetlands uh, and that's basically due to uh, WRP programs and the like to kind of save and protect those areas. Uh, a lot of mitigation programs for different uh, constructions. Um, again, grassland species decline, and more importantly, there's even 20, at least 20 species that we don't even have a trend for. So those birds could be even worse. But, uh, but our grassland obligates and whole are doing pretty bad. And so that's why we're not just looking at bob whites, it's grassland species in general. Um, Again, grassland areas are in decline in the southeast and, you know, across the nation and the world, and it goes back to needing more ag land. Um, as Corey mentioned, you know, we're looking at kind of this area in here, and once, you know, trees get established, we lose that quality habitat unless we thin it out to come back to this. <clears throat> and these are different species that uh, utilize different parts of habitat. Uh, types. Uh, TJ went over this fairly well. Southeastern Pinelands. They actually used to extend from the James River up here all the way down to the Trinity River in eastern Texas. So that was a huge area of, uh, of southeastern what was considered Pinelands and, and typically you know open grassland 
our grass savannas, our pine savannas, and uh, roughly 60 to 90 million acres of it. And it's been declining for a long time. I want, I think it's only a couple million now. Yeah. So uh, how did this get, how did these areas maintain themselves? Um, one was through fire, you know, either naturally or man-made. Um, and back then it had been Indians. Uh, so fire played a key role. And uh, if you can see, it's kind of hard, but, uh, you know, it's Grande Savannah. Um, this looks like it's a Spanish map that was created a long time ago. But, uh, but they're estimating that we only have 98% of our um, pine land savannah, longleaf pine savannas left, and uh, Piedmont prairies. And this is what they estimated to be a Piedmont prairie before. Um, kind of give you an idea, everybody realized we used to have bison and elk in South Carolina. Now if you think of those species, what do you think? Grasslands, open wooded areas, you know, that's the kind of stuff they, they prefer. Um, we actually had an elk in South Carolina for a while, a couple years ago. Um, he didn't stay around very long though. Um, but yeah, there's a reason they were there. Prairie, uh, Piedmont prairie areas, um, pine savannas, just large open areas and typically created by fire and grazing. Well, grazing is pretty much gone from our native species. I don't think we will ever have that many deer in South Carolina to graze that large of an area. Um, and so, you know, that part of it's gone. Fire has declined as well. And so we're, that's one of the main reasons we're losing these areas. And uh, this is actually a Piedmont Prairie area. And these are usually created naturally through severe fires. Um, now granted, nobody wants to lose that much timber to a fire, but it happens. Uh, lightning strikes were the predominant causes of these fires, and typically if you think lightning strikes and fires, it's usually in the summer drier months. And if you think about what this past September was, how dry it was, imagine if we had a fire, you know, a major fire start then and how long it would take to put, get it under control. But that's how naturally our fire started. And uh, about 4,000 years before the present, um, the appearance of regular fires occurred. Um, this was kind of a time when Indians were still hunter-gatherers, and they realized that when they burned these areas, it attracted more wildlife. And so that made their, their hunting success go up. Uh, about a thousand years before now, um, the Mississippian culture, they started more uh, farming practices. And again, fire was a key role in that, in that they could establish a large open area around an established uh, village and one, they could see for a long ways to protect their village. And two, they had to do very little uh, land disturbance to, to plant. And again, it also attracted um, local wildlife. And about 250 years ago, there was a dramatic decrease in fire. Uh, just think more populations, it's not as safe anymore. So if you're wanting to burn like you did in the old times and you didn't have to worry about a neighbor for 10 miles or so down the road, that's, you know, you got a neighbor half a mile down the road now. Um, and so fire was a very big player in the development of our, uh, of our world. And uh, this is just kind of showing kind of the frequency of fires. And you see most of our area was uh, typically understory fires from zero to 10 years. And if you look in our drainages in that pink, those were actually stand replacement fires about every 35 years. And so it, it kind of gives you an idea of what it took to maintain these areas. Um, so what is prescribed fire? It's the knowledgeable and controlled application of fire to a specific land area to accomplish a planned resource management objective. You know, we're not just gonna go out there and drop a match and say, okay, I burn. You need to go out there with a plan. You need to know what you're wanting to do, how you're gonna do it, and what's gonna be the best time to do that. Uh, typically what I like to do is, I like to be in the woods now and I'm looking at my stands to determine which ones need to be burned, 
what time of year is probably going to best suit that. Um, looking at from you know how open the canopy is, if it's a real open can canopy, I can get away with a lot later fire. If I got a sweet gum issue, I can burn in September and not have to worry about crown scorch. Um, so uh, basically you need to have a plan and you need to have a written plan prepared before you do anything else. But uh, these fires are managed in such a way to minimize the emission of smoke and maximize the benefits. Smoke is your number one concern when you burn. If you've got your fire brakes installed properly, it's not a concern as far as the fire jumping, especially if you're following weather. But as far as um, getting a burn plan or a burn number, they're more concerned about your smoke. Um, so what are the benefits? It removes the litter layer. Remember, quail are very weak scratchers, or they're not as good as turkeys anyway. So they don't want to fight through a whole thick duff layer. Uh, it stimulates new growth. That's good for bugging. That's good for the chicks. You know, they do eat some plant matter. Um, that's good for other wildlife species. Deer will browse on it before they browse on something that's two years old. So, um, so it, you know, that new growth isn't just for your quail chicks and your quail, it's for all the wildlife species there. Um, and also cover must be, tamed, must be maintained. If you've planned it right, you're gonna have areas in your unit that just won't burn, be it, you know, it's real shrubby in there and it's got a high humidity underneath. Those areas shouldn't burn, so you should have within your burn a mosaic of unburned areas. And so that also help with your stand diversity within that unit. So where you have nesting cover, broodery and cover, and you know, escape and loafing cover. And it increases the plant diversity, but that's only if you have an open canopy. The, I read that pine savannas have one of the greatest species richness of any other habitat in the world in the world, the greatest species richness, because, and the key to their survival is fire. Fire is key to preserving that species richness. <clears throat> uh, so increases, so other benefits is it increases quail use over unburned. Um, again, you're looking at the litter layer. You're, you got plants that are moving up out of their reach for uh, bugging and feeding and you're losing that overhead cover the higher it gets. Uh, limitations of prescribed burning, smoke. That is your number one limitation, limiting factor. Uh, I've dealt with a couple uh, properties that are right up against Interstate 26. You're not gonna be burning anything close to that interstate. Um, not if you have any sense anyway. Um, so you got advanced understory development. So if it's been a while since you've burned and you're looking to kill you know, sweet gums, eight, 10 foot tall with fire, it's gonna be a really hot fire before you kill that tree. And if you get a fire that hot, you're probably doing some uh, crown scorch and other things to your pine trees, which most pine trees can get by with that. Um, a pine tree only needs 25% of its length and foliage to survive. Oaks are about 50%. So, um, so if you scorch a tree and think you've killed it, well, if you look up top and you still see green, you're probably good. You're looking at about 25% green. That's all a pine tree needs. Um, excessive fuel loads, again, if it hadn't been burned in a while, uh, you might be uh, calling Jamie with the Forestry Commission to do it for you. Uh, that They'd be more apt to be able to control those burns on specific uh, humidity days to where they're just eating away at that litter layer slowly over time instead of trying to burn it all off at once. Uh, invasives, Japanese climate fern, I can tell you from experience, they love fire. And you do it at the wrong time or you can do it at all and it'll, you'll just turn into a carpet of climate fern all through your stand. Uh, so you have to take invasives and their uh, likeness to fire into consideration and in, in adequate fuels. If you got a real sandy area, you're not gonna be able to burn that thing very often. Um, so you need to take into consideration how your fuels lay out across the property. Could be a good thing in that, you know, it's sandy enough, you're going to preserve some of these areas for that nesting cover or that uh, escape and loafing cover. Uh, season and frequency. Um, as you can see, you know, an annual summer burn, you get plenty of grasses. 
a lot less uh, woody vegetation overhead than periodic winter fire. Um, I highly recommend a variation or a combination of all these and everything in between. And this kind of, yeah. And again, it's going to, um, what you're trying to do with the area is going to determine what fire you do and how often you do it. If you're looking for escape cover, you're probably looking to do something like that. Now, you don't want to do that on 40 acres. Um, you might want to just have, you know, little one acre chunks here and there within that area that you just break out and you maybe only burn it three years, every three years. Um, this kind of compares uh, lightning strike fires with uh, actual acres plan for burning. Um, again, you notice there's a huge uptick in May of actually planned burns. Why do you think that is? What happens once you get out into June, July, and August, and even now into September? It gets really dry. And so that's when lightning fires, you know, you get those dry lightning strikes, and that's when they really take hold. And you can see the month of July, you know, June, July, and August, they're pretty high. But if you do this in a controlled way before the lightning strikes have a chance to take over, you remove the chance of having an escape fire on your hands. Um, and this has been proven time and time again, you know, controlled burns actually reduce wildfires. And again, this is just kind of comparing your objectives. Uh, this slide should be in your presentation of, you know, if you're looking to manage for native perennial grasses, um, and it's been found that pretty much you burn any time, you're going to get some kind of perennial grass to come into your unit. Um, same with native forbs, so I, I encourage you as you're burning, adjust the timing of your burning and see what comes. If you've got something that's working well, you know, stay, stick with it for a while, but you'll also find if you burn the same time every year, you're going to get a proliferation of those plant species that like that timing. So you're going to get overrun with, say, broom sedge, and you're going to lose your forb component. So you might want to eventually start staggering that around where you burn it this time one year or two years in a row, and then you skip and say, all right, well, I'll just do a winter burn this year and let some of that woody vegetation come back in. So uh, just keep that in mind. You know, always vary it. Take good notes on, you know, how the burn went, what came up after the burn was completed. Um, impacts of growing season burns. Uh, you will lose quail nests. That's basically what this is saying. You're going to lose some nests. It's going to happen. But these birds have grown, have survived in a fire community for two and a half million years. They, they're adapted to it. That's why they nest so much. Uh, compare it to a rat. They have a lot of people that eat. There's a lot of things that eat it. People don't eat rats. There's a lot of animals that eat rats. There's a lot of animals that eat uh, quail. It's nature's chicken. They eat every part of it. And so they have adapted to breed prolifically to make up for that. You know, rats rarely live past a year old or mice. So do quail. There's a lot of things to eat them. So uh, we, it's just been found that, you know, these animals that live in these fire adapted communities are adapted to living with fire. So we may lose a few nests here and there, but in the long run, it's more beneficial because they'll come back in or they'll go to the next block over and nest again. And again, this is just talking about patch burning. So you get that. So if you burn during the growing season, you might lose a nest in there. Well, they'll just hop over here somewhere and uh, make another nest, you know, wherever they find the next best habitat. Um, and, and that's why you, you don't want to just burn that whole block at once because then you lose all of it. And it's a larger area that bird's got the cover to find something. So if you break it up smaller, um, it gives the bird a lot, gives quail a lot more opportunities to find something else. Um, and typically 40 to 60 acres or larger, you can burn half to a third. Uh, I got a lady, she's interested in wildlife management. She's got 15 acres. She's kind of wanting to do it on her own. Uh, I recommend just making little half acre blocks that she can manage and she can go out there and burn herself if she wants to. Um, so it, 40 to 60 acres typically you can burn about half of it and still have quality habitat remaining for quail. Uh oh, There we go. Interspersion, so basically just saying 
you know, instead of having just large chunks that you're going to have different habitat, habitats in, you're going to break it down even smaller, you know, to where you're burning 20 to 60 acre blocks instead of 100 acre blocks. So you get that good dispersion of different habitat types. <clears throat> so in some summary, you burn a lot, uh, use both growing and dormant season burns. And if you can stretch those burns out through the year, I recommend you doing so. You'll find that you'll get a lot different response from you burning in February, you burning in May, and burning in September. You're gonna get totally different responses. So if you got a chance to experiment with fire in different times of the year, do it. Uh, I'll end with this, because um, this is just going over different areas where you know they've burned some areas at different times. Uh, this was longleaf that was burned in January. But as you can see, it's got a lot of good nesting habitat there. Almost too much nesting habitat. And you know, you just burn it and keep going through it. And look there, that's what I was talking about. You look at that and you think, oh my gosh, what did I do? But look, 25% of that tree has to survive, that's it. Um, and usually with longleaf, this is why they're so good with fire, those bunches of needles around the tips of those limbs, they, they insulate that terminal bud from the heat. And so you'll get a lot of regrowth just from that. And if you look, it was burned in February. And by August, look at all the good foraging and uh, nesting cover that was created again. You're starting to get more nesting cover in June. So um, <clears throat> again, you know, it's created a lot better habitat just keeping fire in your rotation. You know, a bunch of different forbs, grasses, legumes. Um, if you're going to burn, you have to have a certified prescribed fire manager uh, certificate. Basically, it's a one day course. They don't teach you anything about burning, burning in particular. They're telling you the importance of knowing where your smoke's going to be able to uh, read your fire weather reports and make determinations based, based on that. Uh, they're not going to go out there and show you how to burn. But to get your certificate, you have to have at least five burns that you've done before you get that. So uh, if you want to look into that, uh, you can go to this website. Again, it's in your slides and uh, get signed up for it. It's a good course. Uh, then there's Prescribed Fire Council. Lots and lots of good information can be had at these meetings they do. Um, before we go to questions, um, Jamie, how much does the Forestry Commission charge to burn? $21 an acre. $21 an acre. Right. To so spray or mow or mechanically remove this stuff, you would pay between $50 and $100 or more per acre to have that done. If you are not, how many people in here are managing for wildlife? How many people are managing for timber? If you do not have fire in your management plan for any of that, you're losing money. Because if you're not burning to clean up the competition, to clean up the other store, you got other trees that are gonna start competing with your timber if timber is your most important thing. If wildlife is, you're losing your understory habitat to everything that's you know six foot and above, out of reach of anything we have out there. So if you're not using fire, you're shooting yourself in the foot. It is the cheapest, fastest method we have to manage our properties. Uh, any questions? Like I said, I tried to go fast. Yes, sir? It's a one-day course. Um, it varies. They usually have about three a year. There are three coming up. Yeah, but they get filled up very fast. I think the Columbia one, which may already be passed, but it's not as last year. Okay, it was full anyway. The November 6th, there's going to be one in Florence if it's not full. And then there's a couple other ones. But you can go to that website, go to the Forestry Commission website, and uh, look there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a little bit of protection for you under that certification if something goes wrong. You're not required to have it to burn. Yeah, you don't have to have it, but it's good to have it.
environment in there that was going to be burned by. <coughs> yeah. You have to call the state before you burn. Right? Right. Yes. I mean, is that, does that mean like the bump is burning the trash pile that was maybe tall as this room? Is it, it's not like I'm trying to burn. Any outdoor fire. Yeah, any outdoor fire, you're supposed to call the motor fire. Uh, now, if it's just a brush pile, there's an automatic automated system. You can usually just leave your name, number, location, or whatever. But if you're doing a prescribed burn, you have to call and they'll ask you questions. And they'll ask you if you're a certified prescribed fire manager. You don't have to give them a number, but they ask for that. And what that does is it just tells them that you are certified. And if you are planning to prescribe burn yourself, it's good to have this and that you know you call and get your prescribed fire number for the day to burn your unit, but also call the local fire department and dispatch because I've had several stories of folks, they're burning, they might have stopped for lunch on the back end of the property and you know they get back to the front and the fire department's out there putting their fire out. Uh, just from somebody seeing smoke and say, oh, there's a fire and they're not, they don't know that it's a prescribed fire and so they call the fire department. Well, they don't know, so they head out there too. So, all good information. Any other questions? That's part of getting your certification. The class is the initial step. Uh, you will not get a, a, a number until you've actually burned five different times. So you've literally called, got a prescribed fire number or a burn number for the day for your plan. You know, it has to have a plan. Um, and those are available on the Forestry Commission's website. You can find a lot of them if you just Google. But, you know, you start. You know, I start this time of year and I create all my burn plans for everything I'm going to do. And they're sitting in my truck. And if the weather turns out great for a certain unit, I'm pulling that plan out. I'm calling the Forestry Commission, get my number. If you do, they will ask if you have a prescribed fire number. If you say no, there needs to be someone on that has that number, but your name will go on it as the burn boss, the lead. And that's how you get your burn experience. You have to have a record of five burns and you can do that with the plans and then you'll get your certification. So once you get your five burns in, you'll turn that in how, I can't remember, it's been so long, but you'll turn it in or turn something in to show that you've done your five burns, and then they'll send you a, a burn number and then that number will go on all your burn plans. Any other questions?